I might have to talk pretty loudly to, to get over the, uh, the background noise here. Now, these slides are available at, uh, at this web address, if you're interested. Along with my, uh, my Lua talk from yesterday. So I want to tell you first about uh, common, uh, co common security vulnerabilities that we see in MediaWiki, uh, namely cross-site scripting, CSRF, uh, registered globals and SQL injection. And cross-site scripting is, is probably the most common for MediaWiki. It occurs when an attacker is able to uh, inject JavaScript into a page on a trusted domain. So uh, the attacker controls what JavaScript is inserted in there, usually by including the JavaScript in a URL. Um, so they, you might visit an external web page and then they redirect you back to the victim web page. Uh, and um, then, you, then the user sees that script. It results in, uh, in any authenticated request can, can occur. So on Wikipedia, that might mean editing pages or you know, blocking users or whatever. Uh, session hijacking, so the, the cookies might be disclosed. Um, and even password disclosure. Since if you can control what scripts are running on someone's page, you can cause a dialog box to pop up which asks for someone's password. And if you type in your password and the, the script has control, then it can, it can obtain that password. Um, so here are two types of XSS vulnerability. One is reflected XSS, like the, uh, the vulnerability I was just telling you about where you have a, an external website which r r gives you a URL. Um, in this case, it's a vulnerability because it looks like it might be secure since the, u the developer here is called, calling HTML special chars. Um, but HTML special chars does not escape single quotes. And you can see that single quotes have been used for this attribute here. So that means that you can, you can uh, terminate that attribute by including single quotes in the request string. And um, that way inject attributes, like a, an on-click attribute. So when the user clicks that, the, the script will run. Um, another type of XSS, XSS vulnerability is uh, stored XSS where um, uh, where stored data from the database is implicitly trusted on the output side. Uh, I've given an example of some typical code here. Now it's assumed that um, the article title has come from user input which is not secure and here we have it outputted in, in an insecure way. So the, the risk is that the title, instead of just containing a short string as the developers expected, it might contain a script tag, um, which, which uh, includes a malicious script. So to avoid XSS, the basic principles are to validate input and to escape output. So don't trust any input from anyone. Um, escape uh, everything, uh, no matter where it comes from, close to the output preferably, so that the reviewer and even yourself can verify that the escaping was done, okay? So if you have, uh, if you have a thousand lines of code separating you know, the, the place where the escaping is meant to be done and the place where it's actually output, it can be difficult to verify um, you know, if you have to look through a whole lot of code and a whole lot of layers of abstraction. Um, and always use double quotes for attributes if you have to use this style of code generation since HTML special chars is a, that's a that's a common vulnerability type. Um, to review for cross-site scripting, you just have to look for the places where HTML is constructed. Uh, identify insecurely injected variables into that HTML and trace the data flow backwards to find out where that data came from. If you find during your tracing that uh, uh, there's a safe escaping function, 
then you stop tracing and uh, you go on to the next variable. And if there was no escaping and you get back to the input, then you consider how trusted that input was. Uh, and then that, that's how you can tell whether there's XSS or not. Uh, reviewing other text protocols is much the same. You use the same method. Um, you um, SQL, CSS, shell commands, wiki text, uh, they're all uh, they're all vulnerable to their own kinds of vulnerabilities where, where user input is injected in an, in an insecure way. And a lot of, uh, any, pretty much any do-it-yourself text protocol, communicating between different modules of a large application uh, is um, liable to have this kind of security vulnerability. Okay, so we've got an exercise now. If you've got your laptops on, if you can navigate to um, tstyling.com slash xss, you'll find that will redirect you to GitHub, where uh, a certain extension is hosted, which is insecure. Now, so the challenge for my audience here is to try to work out in what way it is insecure, in particular where the xss is introduced. So to get you started, I've, had a, I've got a hint there. Have a look in embedvideo.hooks.php. So just scroll down and click that link. And um, yeah, the, the parser function uh, uh, functions there have insecure inputs, just straight from user input. So um, yeah, I'll give you a minute to have a look at those. And maybe I'll wander around and, and check if anyone needs help with that. Top. Oh well. Mm -hmm. Any difficulties? How are you going, Daniel? You got your, yeah, yeah, you got your, yeah, you got it up. Hmm? You, yeah, you found it already. Uh, not quite, but not I quite. think I'm on the right track. Yeah, Actually, it feels like I reviewed this thing before. <laughs> Someone put a template on MediaWiki.org a year ago. Um, uh, maybe, uh, the, but maybe not you. Yeah, no, but all the the um, media embedding extensions are generally pretty horrible. Okay. I'll start going through it myself in a, in a, a few seconds, okay? All right, so anyone found some XSS vulnerabilities yet? How are we doing? Yeah, maybe, possible. Okay, let's have a look at the code. I do like my, uh, my GVIM for doing this sort of work. So like I was saying, the, the procedure is uh, just scroll through until you find some, uh, some constructed HTML. So here's some here. Uh, you know, there's some more, there, there's a whole lot of it. Um, and then um, just follow the data flow back. So this desk here is injected insecurely we can just jump back to its caller, have a look at desk, where does it come from? Turns out that it comes from recursive tag pass. So uh, 
So in this case, it's secure. Okay, recursive tag pass happens to be a secure function. All right, we don't have to worry about that one. Well, let's have a look at another one. Say if we look at, at width. Okay, now we'll look at the caller for that one. Where does it come from? Let's just scroll up, look at the highlighted widths there. It comes from sanitize. Okay, so if we've got this function sanitize width, with, which looks like it's doing validation. So let's have a look at it. And it looks like it's fairly secure. If something's numeric, it's probably not going to have a script in it. That's, that's, a, that's a secure way to do validation. Okay, so, so that's probably all right too. Look at what? Yeah, that's um, probably okay. one of these ones. Okay, it's private, so okay, we can ignore the fact that it's not a public function, so you don't, you yeah. don't expect users to set something no. else. Okay. So um, let's have a look at this align, dollar this align here. So um, let's just trace that back to the caller. Here's dollars align. Now, where does it come from? Oh dear, no escaping. Straight from user input. So there's an XSS vulnerability right there. Okay, dollars align definitely vulnerable. I got to that point, but how do I know that this comes straight from user input? Well, because I gave you in a hint. <laughs> See, I said it's a, in my hint that it is actually user input. Uh, okay. You, you would have to know MediaWiki to know that. That's why I, I put it on my slide and there. Another thing, it's a public function anyway. So you that doesn't come from user input, it can come from yeah. another developer yeah. who doesn't know this That's particular right. class. Basically, whenever you have any user, you always be scared. Right? Yeah. But the question was, can I actually say that this is definitely coming from user Yeah. Yeah, it, it just so happens that it is. Okay. And um, I'll do one more. Um, Now, let's have a look at where this URL is coming from. Um, now, the URL in, in these things, you can see that the URL, it's Im embedded in insecurely. And uh, where does it come from? Well, it comes from this WFMSG replace args. That doesn't do any escaping. OK, so it, it inserts these three parameters into the URL. It, so it basically replaces this, this format of the URL with, uh, and um, replaces some, some variables in there. I can show you that, but, but yeah. Uh, um, if ID contains HTML, then the URL is going to contain HTML too. And so let's look at ID and where that comes from. OK. So you can see it's it's trimmed here, not really a. Oh, and here we've got. Okay, so here we've got a, a um, validation function for verify ID. Uh, let's just see what that's actually doing. Okay, and it turns out that verify ID is doing nothing. I, I don't know if anyone spotted that, but um, verify ID not doing anything because uh, it just checks if HTML special chars is returning null, which it never actually does. There's some code here which, which was kind of heading in the right direction for a validation function, but it's commented out, so, so that doesn't work either. Okay, so, so there's, well, we've found two or three XSS vulnerabilities there in this code. Sorry to interrupt. Is it actually possible for you to hear again? Okay. I just wanted to check. Right. So, yeah, that's how to find XSS. There's some, uh, some answers, just in case the web wasn't working. Um, Quick question. Uh, yeah. Pro has a notion of tainted variables, which yeah. is basically uh, a pretty smart way to try to detect something like this. It feels a bit easy to make it a language feature. But at least for some kind of code uh, analysis or debugging one, it may be quite nice to have something like that. Yeah, there was, that, there was a patch for PHP a while ago that introduced Perl style tainting. Uh, I thought it was pretty, pretty good, but uh, it didn't really go anywhere and the, the PHP developers didn't pick it up. So, um, yeah. yeah, that would be pretty good. 
Uh, so let's move on to CSRF or cross-site request forgery. Um, the way CSRF works is off-site JavaScript submits a form on behalf of an authenticated user or, or just redirects the user to a, a URL that takes some right action on the database. Um, when that off-site JavaScript does that, uh, it uses the, the cookies of the, uh, the victim website, right? Despite the fact that the external website's doing it, it uses the victim's cookies. So, the, so if you're logged into some sensitive web service, like your bank, and you go to some external website, that external website can then attempt to attack your, your bank, uh, logged in as you, right? It's, it's probably the most common type of web app vulnerability. Uh, it's, it's a very common pitfall for experienced de inexperienced developers. So, you know, it's not so common on MediaWiki, uh, but, but it's extremely common in the world in general. Um, how you avoid it in, in MediaWiki is you use HTML form if possible. That's a, that's a class for building, a, building forms in HTML, which is, um, which has CSRF protection built in. Uh, if you want to do your own forms, you would use, use a get edit token. Um, there's some example code showing you how to use, use a get edit token. Basically, we use the, uh, the same origin policy um, to prevent, um, so to, when you request, uh, when you send that, that request across, uh, across domains, you can send the request, but you can't receive the reply, okay? The same origin policy prevents external websites from, from fetching content from, from, um, from another website. Um, so we take advantage of that by including a random token in the HTML, which the, uh, the person who submits the, webs the, the, the form is then required to have that token in the, in the form, okay? So if it's an external website, there's no way to, for them to get the token, and so they can't uh, finish the right action. So uh, yeah, that's what this is doing. We're just, we just have to include a random token in the HTML, and then check if it was submitted correctly uh, when the form is submitted. Uh, to review for CSRF, it's pretty straightforward. In MediaWiki, you just check if the, uh, the form submission path is calling user match edit token, and usually if they are, then they're, they've d done it all right. Um, you can do it in a black box way. You don't really need the code to, to test for, um, for CSRF. Um, you just check the HTML s source to see if there's a random token in there, and uh, if you modify the edit token, you should be able to verify that the form does not submit correctly and that that right action is not taken. Um, yeah, I can give you a quick demo of doing this black box, box testing. You can do this against any web app. Like if you're interested in whether your bank is secure, you can go and do this to your bank if you like. Um, so, so this is from my uh, previous attempt just, uh, just half an hour ago upstairs, the, the first iteration of this. Um, not sure if we just um, I may just interject. Yeah. Apart from security issues, this whole token thing ensures that you don't submit the same form twice, which is another uh, very useful feature. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's worth doing it even if you're doing it for things that on which is very don't really worry about cross advertising. So no network. Let's just move on. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's pretty straightforward to, to test for that. Just look at the HTML source, and uh, you can see whether there's edit tokens or not. Um, a lot of websites, you'll find that they don't, have, bank websites do obviously have CSRF protection. They have people who are very well paid to insert such CSRF protection. But, um, but a lot of miscellaneous authenticated websites do not. So um, things like um, management interfaces of, of web servers, uh, you know, to reboot them or see the serial console, sometimes they don't have it, uh, you know. Um, 
management interfaces of VPS servers. I think I think Linode is not protected against CSRF. Last time I checked, it wasn't. Uh, so you know, make sure that you log out of your Linode management interface before you go and visit another website. That's the the moral to that story. Well, they can request that form, but they can't read the response because of the same origin policy. Oh, yeah, okay. Yep. At least not in the standard browser. Yeah, okay. If the browser is broken, you're lost. That's yeah. right, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah, it, there's various ways that browsers can be broken to allow the same origin policy to be violated, and, and that might be called a CSRF vulnerability in the browser. Okay, next uh, vulnerability class, we've got that JavaScript cross-site data leakage. Um, so this is a case where that same origin policy is violated. Um, sometimes it's vi violated to good effect and sometimes it's violated accidentally in, in web apps and causing a security vulnerability. Um, so the script tag in HTML allows code to be executed in the context of it of a uh, of another site, um, so the uh, another site that's including a script tag from your website can uh, can set up the environment in such a way that they can gather all of the data that's in the the, uh, the script. Um, so yeah, if you generate scripts, um, then this can be a, a problem for you. Uh, in particular, we had a vulnerability uh, in MediaWiki recently, which where the the CSRF tokens were actually supplied via executable JavaScript. So uh, it, it was a pretty silly mistake by us uh, to, to do that, but yeah. Um, I, uh, I ha even had the, the bug up here, but... Um, so this is, this is what happened. Um, yeah, we had a user.tokens module and it just had the user tokens in it as stated and there was not the correct protection against um, against requesting that offside. Yeah, so this was just a couple of months ago and there was a security release because of that. So um, even Jason uh, requests that re return JSON can be vulnerable to this kind of attack if the JSON is not a pass error, if it's a valid code snippet. And what that usually means is, is a, an array literal rather than an object literal in JavaScript. So any JSON that you return from your scripts should have, uh, should be object literals. Uh, that, that's the safest way to do it. Um, how is it different? Well, um, an, an object literal with a comment in it, uh, with a comma. So more than more than one element in your object literal is a pass error in JavaScript. So if you try to do a script tag that uses that as a source, it won't work. Okay, it won't run. Whereas if it's an array literal, you can override the array constructor and then include the script tag, right, and then you can get the data from that array. Um, well, again, I'll show you if I, had, if I had network, but I don't think I have. You can see I've been researching for this talk here on, on our SP, but I don't think I managed to to find it. Anyway, all right, I'll move on. Um, okay, so coding practices to avoid this kind of vulnerability: use API.php because we have protections built in to API.php to avoid this sort of thing. Um, don't include private data in resource loader responses, except if they're in the private group. 
So in your resource loader module, that's a subclass and you have to have this, this function overridden to, to be in the private group. Most people don't usually create resource loader modules. There's not much reason to do that, um, except in very special cases. But if you do it, then, there, then there's this problem. Um, all right, register globals. Um, register Glo globals was deprecated in PHP 5.3 and removed in PHP 5.4. So um, uh, we think it's still probably commonly enabled on shared hosts, but, but my hope is that in a, in a few years, maybe I'll be able to delete this slide from my slide deck and we won't have to worry about register globals anymore. But for now, you still do have to worry about it. Um, MediaWiki historically encouraged vulnerable code, so MediaWiki has had ongoing problems with, with register globals. Um, and even when, when there hasn't been MediaWiki itself being insecure, we've had extensions mimicking MediaWiki's insecure style, like semantic MediaWiki. We could have probably chosen uh, conventions that would have avoided it. Now I'll explain what Register Globals is. Register Globals um, is a php.ini setting, which when enabled, um, it causes request variables, such as variables in the URL and variables in the form, to be registered as global variables present at the request start, okay? And um, this is a problem when um, you have a PHP file uh, ending in .php, which is not intended to be an entry point, but happens to be web accessible. Um, so um, then the attacker can uh, use a URL like, like I've got here with uh, IP equals whatever, and then that defines a global variable called IP, which then if you have a script with a required dollars IP, here I've got an, an example. If you have this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, code at the top of a script, then that can be um, attacked with a URL like this. Yeah. So uh, PHP did in include, they, they introduced an any setting which um, does not allow URLs to be, uh, to be used in require or include. Um, and they, um, they thought that that would deal with most of the problem, but there's still, a, there's still a lot of different ways to exploit this if you have vulnerable code. Like you can upload a, a file, if there's like a, file, a temporary file upload, you can then refer to that temporary file upload in, in, you know, in your um, dollars IP before PHP gets around to deleting it. Or uh, in my example here, I've used, uh, assuming the, uh, the web server is on Windows, you can access SMB paths with a double backslash. Um, so yeah, they did not bother to, to fix that. And um, there was some discussion on the PHP mailing list about it, and they concluded that that's the problem of the person running Windows. It's not PHP's <laughs> problem. So how do you avoid it? Um, you, you can use the autoloader. That has the advantage also of, uh, of lazy initialization. So then your file is only included when it's actually needed. I've got some, some boilerplate there for using the autoloader. Um, and another alternative is to use dir name file for including relative file paths instead of using $IP. That's sensible for extensions. That's probably the most commonly used um, uh, method for extensions. To review for register globals vulnerabilities, all you have to do is read, at the, top, read the top of each file to see if there's vulnerable uses of, of global variables which aren't defined. Uh, there's also an automated scanner that catches most of them um, at, at that URL there. It's called RG Volmcheck. It's, um, it's a bit difficult to set up. You've got to set up a dedicated web server uh, with, with a special configuration and you've got to you know, compile some PHP extensions, uh, patch PHP even, uh, to make that work properly. So it's a bit of a hassle, um, but, but we run that occasionally ourselves. I'm not sure, but can this be... Uh, I don't think this can be... No, we can't. There's no way to disable it for MediaWiki to disable it. Um, From, uh, or for yeah, yeah, because the globals are already injected by the time MediaWiki gets control. If um, 
if the request is started using a normal entry point, MediaWiki can and and does um, check the request to see if there's any uh, if there's registered globals enabled, and if there is, it'll delete any globals which are registered by it. Um, but but that doesn't help you when you come in via another entry point. Okay, SQL injection. It's um, relatively rare in MediaWiki. We haven't had many of these reported, um, but pretty common in other in the the internet in general. Um, outside of, uh, of the you know the big web frameworks, uh, it's uh, it's extremely dangerous. It can be used to disclose uh, disclose the entire contents of the database. It's there's been a number of high profile cases of SQL injection being used to obtain databases. For example, Sony, uh, their, their database was completely compromised. Um, here is an example of some vulnerable code. Um, you get a limit from the request and then substitute it into a very harmless looking uh, query here, which the, the results of this are assumed to be output to the user somehow. Um, now, if we just set limit in the request to be this, this string here starting from this one, then what this will do instead, instead of uh, you know, displaying a table of, of you know, kittens and their names and photos, it'll, it might substitute the name for the user password hashes of all of the users on the site. Okay? Um, so yeah, union is the, is the main problem here. It just it may be a misfeature in SQL, but that's, that's the, uh, the mainstay of exploiting this kind of vulnerability. Um, to avoid SQL injection, use query builder functions like, like database uh, select. But you should know their limitations. You have to re read the documentation of them because there are certain cases when they accept SQL expressions. Um, so, um, for example, if you have a, an inequality, um, this is a, a condition which is an SQL expression and this code is vulnerable because um, you could inject into this time here, you could inject your union and then, uh, then you know, read out whatever you want to read out. In some databases, you can in in inject entire extra statements. So you can do write actions uh, by, by having a semicolon and then some other statement. In MySQL, that's not possible. So, yeah. All right. Um, We've still got some time left, so I'll go through our less common vulnerability types, which are nonetheless still very important. Um, first one is click jacking. That occurs when the, uh, the victim page is included in the attacker site as an iframe, and then you use some clever little CSS hacks to make the, the um, victim site appear on top, in terms of Z order, on top of the attacker site, but invisible, transparent. Okay, so then um, the, uh, the, the attacker site can, can place a button underneath the buttons in the, uh, in the victim site so that when you try to click on the button in the attacker site, you accidentally click a button in the victim site. Okay, that's basically how clickjacking works. Um, it can be used to take some malicious action like CSRF, uh, clicking on buttons that you didn't mean to click on. Or, um, but if the website encourages you to, you to drag and drop in their website to achieve some goal, you can trick the user into dragging and dropping sensitive information out of the, the uh, victim website and into the attacker's website where it can be accessed by scripts. The um, standard technique to, to mitigate this is to not allow framing, okay? You just deny all framing. And to do that, you have to send this special header, X frame options. And that's the default for anything using output page. Um, to, uh, to allow framing, uh, you have to call this function allow click jacking, which is, which is um, yeah, we, we figured that there'd be no, no uh, mistaking what that actually does to, to allow framing. Um, now, um, that's actually called at the moment on action equals view, which is, which is 
probably not going to be called for very much longer because uh, we've been hearing in the last couple of days about uh, about people including all sorts of great forms on action equals view uh, and and that you know inline editing apparently is, is a great new thing so on Wikipedia soon we'll probably have to make it so that you can not include even action equals view in a, in a frame on another site. Yeah. But yeah, but I know you can't drag and drop from one frame to another. Maybe try doing that maybe the... maybe that's a, a recent innovation then, yeah. Well I I'm so trying to do it is, recently, yeah, but I couldn't get the is, is that standard or is it browser dependent on this kind of protection? Mm -hmm. I know I tried it in Chrome and I think in fine. So it should be checked, yeah, but I think yeah. that's the new standard. Kind of so it, it, the browser should prevent that. Well, yeah, they will in a few years. It, it would, yeah, it would have been nice if browsers were really smart about this, but their initial response was just to introduce this header, which all web apps are meant to now set, which just denies all framing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that would have to. Yeah, I, I don't think that is a that's a problem in particular. But you can, um, yeah, yeah. Actually, I don't think the current editor does use use an iframe. I think it uses something else. Anyway, um, yeah. We'll go on to the next one, which is which is IE six extension detection. We had we had to have three uh, subsequent security releases to in order to fix this completely because uh, the person reported it and then we fixed it we you know said you know does this patch look right he said yes you know go ahead release it and then we released it and then immediately he says oh I found another way to exploit this so uh, yeah turns out you didn't fix it so we did a second release and then we found another way to do it so we, we did a third release and it was a bit of a fiasco but um, but the, uh, the, the vulnerability is the fact that Internet Explorer version 6 and earlier can detect file extensions in the query string where there should not be any file extensions, okay? It's, that's not where you put file extensions in after a question mark in the URL. That's not where file extensions go. Um, it undermines assumptions that we've made about the safety of streaming out plain text to the browser. Plain text is in things that the user can control, uh, like action equals raw. Um, so, you know, we, we, we call it plain text. It could have scripts in it, but we assume that the browser is not going to execute those. But if Internet Explorer detects the wrong file extension there, then it could decide that that's actually HTML and that it needs to execute scripts in it. So, um, the solution for extension developers now is just to use the API, like a lot of these things, you know, the API. A lot of these vulnerabilities uh, has the same recommendation. Use the API where we've got protections. Um, and um, if you have to include user input in a, a URL, an API URL, append ampersand star to the end of the URL. Okay? This prevents, this prevents um, our uh, protections against this, this Internet Explorer mechanism from blocking your request and preventing it from being, from being successful, okay? Yeah, until, it, until it's very much dead and buried, but it's not dead and buried yet, and um, yeah. And unfortunately, we, we looked at the, st the statistics at the time. It was just last year, I think, and, and it was still uh, used by enough people to make it well worthwhile doing all this work to fix it. It was it was really an epic amount of work. We were disassembling Internet Explorer. You know, we we like did simulation functions. We've not, now got it in in uh, MediaWiki a complete simulation of the uh, algorithm that Internet Explorer six goes through in order to derive path extensions, and then uh, we use that to determine whether or not a, a request is is uh, problematic. Um, it's it's a separate function. It's a separate class in Internet Explorer. So yeah, we, we and we do have separate classes now to do those two things. We have another class which is also the rever result of reverse engineering of Internet Explorer, uh, which which does content detection. Yeah. But then, um, the essential 
problem was the same there, right? Yeah. Exploring, executing something that's not that's right. HTML or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Internet Explorer being told very explicitly, you know, this is text, this is plain text, it may be dangerous, please do not execute it. And Internet Explorer says, well, you know, maybe you didn't really mean that, right? Okay, you know, may um, yeah. This looks like I'll credit Brian, okay. <laughs> Brian's way of explaining this, Brian Vibber, he, he said, okay, so imagine you, you write on a piece of paper hit yourself in the head with a hammer, okay? And you, you, you say, this is a joke. You give it to someone, hey, here's a, here's a funny joke, and the, the, the paper says, hit yourself in the head, okay? So most people would say, ha, 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 hit yourself in the head with a hammer, whereas if you, you hand that piece of paper to Internet Explorer, it hits itself in the head very hard, right? Yeah. They took the principle that browser starts everything way, way too far. Yeah. <laughs> Um, dangerous uploaded files. We've had a few. Kinda signal. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, looks like we're almost out of time, I guess. But um, are we doing <laughs> ten minutes? Okay. Dangerous uploaded files. Um, there's a wide range of issues that come from uploaded files, but most of them don't concern extension developers. Most of them are the responsibility of the people who maintain the upload code in MediaWiki. Um, but you can have XSS, you can have uh, file type misdetection, you know, leading to all sorts of vulnerabilities, or, like we were just talking in Internet Explorer. Um, browser denial of service, you know, by sending huge images that send the computer into swap. Um, Malware distribution, you know, things that pop up dialog boxes on people's computer asking them to, to install malicious software. Um, so yeah, mostly not a concern for, for extension developers, um, but certainly a concern if you do your own, if you allow file uploads or you're building a file upload extension. Uh, external utilities. Um, there's two reasons that shelling out to external utilities can be insecure. One is, is shell escaping. I've, I've already talked about text protocols and how they can be, they can be um, exploited. The other one is that the security of the app that you're shelling out to. Um, uh, most um, shell commands were not designed with untrusted user input in mind, and so you kind of have to review a shell command if you're going to shell out to it to check whether there's any problems with it. Um, so as an example, GNU plot, GNU plot, uh, you know, was was invented, I don't know, in the 70s sometime. It's it's very ancient software, and it allows you to to include backticks in your user input to execute shell commands. And we did actually have an extension, um, by, but we had an extension called Wikitext, which uh, which shelled out to GNU plot and allowed arbitrary user input, including backticks. Uh, and another example is Image Magic, which uh, had a shell execution vulnerability due to um, it would detect the file type uh, and then of your input files and sometimes do that incorrectly and then um, it would run a shell command to try to convert that file type to some file that it understood, right? And that the the shell escaping that it was doing and shelling out there was insecure. So as a result, Image Magic was running arbitrary shell commands. Uh, cache poisoning uh, happens when private data is sent out with public caching headers for whatever reason. Um, allows the attacker to read the response from the cache server uh, without, without being logged in, without having the correct cookies. Sometimes you can trigger cache poisoning from an external website by causing the browser to request a certain URL from the victim website. And when that's done, the, the scripts running on the, exter on the, the attacker website can, um, they know exactly when that occurs and then they can do the follow-up request to themselves to, to gain that, that, um, that data. So the solution is just to not have public caching, even when the user asks for it, for, uh, well, even when the user asks for it through URL parameters, which might be spoofed, okay? 
Uh, we have an example there if you're interested of a case where MediaWiki had cache poisoning. Um, and finally, uh, security review ethics. Now that I've told you how to review for security, you're probably all going to go out and you review a whole lot of web apps and find a whole lot of security vulnerabilities out there because there's plenty to be found. So when you do find them, um, report them privately to the author of, or maintainer of the code. Uh, don't just post them to a public mailing list or chat about them on IRC. Larger projects have a, have a security at a, a email alias you can use to report these things. For smaller projects, just work out who is the main developer and send an email to that person. Um, don't d disclose uh, security vulnerabilities publicly unless the fix has been released or uh, months have elapsed and you've exhausted all possible avenues for, uh, for a, you know, a, a coordinated uh, information release. Okay. Uh, and that's it. Uh, there's some further reading for you. Uh, OWASP, which is a great wiki project uh, for security. Thanks for listening. Any questions? No? I have answered all your questions on security that you ever had. Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't interfere. Um, so the, the question is that when you get um, do an API request, API have, has uh, CSRF tokens just like we have in, in HTML, and they work much the same way. And uh, usually the, the random token is actually shared between those two mechanisms. Um, but it, that's, it, it, it is either the same or it's, it's um, de derived using it like a salt and a hash. Do you know what I mean? So it's like an MD5 of the same token, okay? Yeah. Um, when I, when I make an API call, I send this um, access token to server. And the server does create a new access token after this request. So my user has a follow-up and an informant, and I send an API request to the server. Afterwards, the user tries to put the form. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah. The, yeah. It sounds like you need to submit a bug about that. Actually, just submit a bug if, if there's if API and and edit form are interfering. That's what it sounds like you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, I think the question is, when you get a new edit token from the API. Does that invalidate any token? Well, uh, it, it, it sounds from your question like it, like it may actually inval invalidate it, but I'm not sure if that's the, the desired behavior. Uh, I'm not sure how, how long that behavior has been there, so I'd have to check that up. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, if you're using the API, you have to have session cookies. You have to, you know, uh, store and, and send back cookies like a browser would in order to support that, that uh, mechanism. Yeah. They may change that. Anyone else? <laughs> okay. huh. Thanks a lot.